Good evening, everybody. Good evening from all over the world. We have people from Colombia, Brazil, Ecuador, Turkey, uh, and of course, many, many people of Belgium. Uh, you're more than welcome to join us at this evening's uh, event. I mean, evening for Belgium. The title of the session of tonight is What Kind of Economists Does the World Need? Uh, we have invited different speakers. Uh, you see them here at, uh, presented at the slide. On the left, we have Emmanuel Mosse. He's an expert in regenerative and circular economy. He's also the co-writer of the Walloon Parliamentary Report on the Circular Economy Strategy, co-author of Shifting Economy. He's a visiting professor at ULB, UNAMUR, ULIEGE, and a couple of other uh, universities. And he's a board member of the Peer-to-Peer -Peer Foundation and a member of the societal committee of New B, uh, a new bank. Jan Mechtens joins us as a staff member of the Federal Council for Sustainable Development. He's an active member of OIKOS, which is a think tank and a magazine. I hear some background. Jan has a monthly column on Mo, which is the Mondial News, and his writing he mainly, mainly focuses on ecological justice. In the middle, you see Leida. Leida is an expert in ecological economics. She's the owner of Leapfrog 2SD Consultancy. She has an educational background in social anthropology, and she's a professional. Oh, as a professional background, she has, she's an activist, a policy director, and a researcher. Uh, to the right of her is Patrick de Bozere. Um, Patrick holds a master degree in political science and a PhD in sociology. He's the scientific director of interface demography at the VUB, Brussels University. And his most recent book, um, Lang Leve de Vergrijzing, is focusing on the relationship between life expectancy, aging populations, and economic thinking. And last but not least, on the right, is Sunchitsa Vucic. She is um, an associate professor of applied econometrics at the University of Antwerp. And her research tackles problems of modern societies and is focused on high income and societal impact. She's a lecturer of applied economics, labor economics, and economics of education. I will do the moderation of the debate. Uh, my name is Eddie van Hemelrijk. I'm a member of Rethinking Economics Antwerp. Um, and I'm also teaching sustainability at the Karel de Groot University of Applied Science in Antwerp. So that's the panel. There is a next slide that I want to show to you with a bit of explanation. Uh, Rethinking economics uh, started in the UK. In the meantime, it's a global movement. It was started by students and academics and professionals. And the goal is to bring pluralist economics into the classroom and in society. Uh, the four you see here, together with some other people, decided to also have a Rethink Economics Antwerp. And so this is actually one of the events we organize. I think we also have our friends from Leuven, Ghent, Brussels, uh, maybe Liège. So in Belgium also joining us. I think Rethink Economics is quite popular. Uh, practical uh, advice, disable your microphones. There is a chat function which you can use if you want to ask questions. They will be forwarded to me afterwards uh, so that I can ask them to the different panelists. If you have a specific question, please make sure you address it also to the person you want to address the question to. That will help us out. Those people joining us on YouTube, also welcome. You can also, I think, add questions on YouTube and they also will be forwarded to me so I can share them with the panelists. So let's start the debate um, with the first opening statement. Uh, and of course, it's uh, linked to what's happening around us uh, globally. So what's the current COVID situation? Uh, what is it demonstrating regarding economics as an academic discipline? And I first would like to have Leida Reinhout reflecting on this question with us. She has about two to three minutes to do so. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I think it's a quite a an, an difficult question because I don't know if the, the, the problem we are dealing at the moment with COVID, if that has to do so much with economics as, as a discipline at the university. But what is indeed uh, the case is that um, mainstream economics 
that we are seeing most of the time in policy making at university, etc. They don't have any answer on the COVID. I mean, they. Uh, but I also can't say that they are the cause of of the whole COVID. I think the problem is not so much with economics as a discipline or uh, economists. I mean, as as persons. Uh, what is, I think, the problem is that the new liberal uh, economic system is get, getting dominant in our society. That means that money is getting more important than anything else. And that, of course, brings us in a system, in an economic model where, where nature, where health, where um, decent jobs, where uh, extraction, all these kind of things are not so much counted. Uh, and I think that's mostly the problem. I know a lot of really great um, people that are economists. Um, I mean, of course, they are all not bad, but the problem is that, um, as I said, at university, what is mostly teached, I don't say only, but mostly, is the neoliberal thinking. I mean, the markets as, as the main goal, having an, an healthy markets uh, with some regulation there. I think sometimes it's a kind of teaching physics without um, really recognizing gravity, um, because what you see in the in the current teaching is that the environment is not integrated. Um, you can study it in environmental economics or ecological economics, but that's only when you have interest to do so. But in in the mainstream economics, environment is a kind of sidelined. It is not really integrated in everything. So as I said, I mean that is I think that's the main problem in the uh, in the economics as it is teached in the I mean in most of the universities. I know there okay. are exceptions. Thank you. Yeah. So you make a distinction between the content of the teaching and so Corona has not so much to do with it, whether we have it now or not. Uh, there are other things which are perhaps more crucial or essential. Yes? Um, well, I, I would not blame uh, economics or economists uh, to have this to have this virus, to, just to say. Okay, so, uh, so the economists are not the cause of it. Okay, let's move to, uh, to Sunchicha. What, uh, so the University of Antwerp, um, what would you like to comment on this opening statement about the relationship between Corona, COVID and, and economical studies? Um, so, I mean, when it comes to the content of uh, economics as a discipline and what we teach at the universities, I will talk uh, a bit later. Mm -hmm. When it comes to COVID-19, I think it's, it's affecting teaching and research in general, not just economics. Uh, and we are faced now with a new reality, which poses a lot of questions to which we really don't have the answers yet. So neither economists nor other um, scientists. Um, so when it comes to economics itself, um, what, the, what the economists have to offer at the moment is the economists toolbox of modeling and predictions and it has proven to be quite useful for analyzing the development of the coronavirus numbers of infection cases and deaths. It provided uh, different uh, uh, scenario analysis per country, for example, on when the peak will be reached. Uh, it also provided counterfactual evidence. So, for example, you could answer the question, what would happen if a country A, say Belgium, would have the same number of daily infections that similar to country B, say Spain or Italy, because these two countries were ahead in comparison to other European countries when it comes to the number of infections and deaths. And this type of analysis really provided very, very persuasive evidence of why we actually need to stay at home, as in Belgium they would say, life in court. Uh, obviously, for economists to give some reliable estimates, uh, you need very good uh, data and reliable data on the number of infection cases deaths. Um, and we have seen in the past weeks that these numbers were not always uh, reported accurately. So that has nothing to do with economists. It has to do with how you measure uh, the infections and deaths. And we've seen that let's say why Belgium has the highest number of deaths per 100,000 population is because we measure it so well. We measure deaths both in hospitals and outside of hospitals, whereas other countries don't do this so precisely. Another thing that I want to add when it comes to economics uh, as a discipline is that uh, just like other disciplines, uh, economics has witnessed a lot of research initiatives, online seminars, and these online seminars like this one really wipe out the borders and time zones 
um, as we can speak uh, with each other no matter where we are. There's a lot of resilience and solidarity. And just to give one example, uh, the European Economic Association has started the registry of COVID-19 economic outcome research projects, which involve gathering and analyzing that data during the COVID-19 crisis on prices, on labor supply, on employment, on household savings, consumption, attitude, sentiments, as well as projects involving theoretical quantitative economic uh, modeling of COVID-19. And if you look, uh, if you go on this registry, which is available online, it shows really hundreds of different initiatives. And these initiatives are both for developed and developing uh, countries. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. So if I can summarize, first of all, you say that uh, economics as a discipline, academic discipline, the toolbox it offered has really helped now in analyzing data and comparing data. So it has been useful. Uh, and the second thing you mentioned that I had, uh, noted is that it also created a lot of solidarity, a lot of initiatives, and not only on a Belgian, but a European and even a global level. So COVID yes. actually initiated and the research uh, economic world responded on it uh, massively by organizing all kinds of events. So it really triggered something and it also triggered cooperation and solidarity between different faculties, universities, governmental institutions. So it has a big impact. Okay, yes. thank you for that. Um, let's move to the gentlemen in our panel. Um, we start with um, Emmanuel. Okay, we have... uh, yeah, I would like to focus when we speak about economics, it's also quite interesting to see what do we teach uh, in the management school uh, in Belgium. And I think for the moment, the techniques and the methodology we teach, generally speaking, in the University of Belgium, is more based to solve uh, classical uh, issues. But if you focus on the answer we can see today uh, to fight the, the virus, we can see that most of the, the solutions, most of the, of the initiative, they are a citizen initiative, they are collaborative initiative, they are based on solidarity, but most of the companies uh, working classically uh, worldwide, they don't have any solutions because when we look for the stock about the mask and other medical equipment, the classical approach, the capitalist approach is not answering uh, this kind of needs. And so I think, um, in fact, the current uh, academic program does not answer what we need to develop in Belgium to fight against a virus like coronavirus. Because okay. we need peer-to-peer -peer economy, we need solidarity, social economy, uh, and we need local economy to develop uh, new kind of solutions. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's a, a, a very straightforward answer. Actually, a bit of an accusation also that the business world and the more neoliberal way of thinking or what we learn at universities did not seem to prepare for COVID and that at the moment the, the support and the help is coming from the citizens and more peer-to-peer -to -peer organizations. So you're questioning a bit what is being at the moment taught in universities, not helping us enough to tackle the COVID-19 crisis. Okay, um, there are two gentlemen left. Uh, Patrick, um, who's a, with a PhD in sociology. So can we have your view on the academics of economics and COVID? Patrick, you have to unmute yourself. Okay, it's unmuted, it's okay? Yeah. Yes, it's okay. So uh, I'm not an economist of, by training um, and I am a demographer, but uh, as a demographer, I have often confronted with economic data. Uh, of course, we as demographers are also uh, implied in this health crisis with COVID uh, and mortality numbers growing all, all over the world and the, the whole discussion about uh, measuring exactly uh, how it is with uh, mortality due to uh, the COVID-19 virus. Um, but if you ask me to reflect on uh, COVID and economy, I think maybe the COVID crisis makes every discussion sharper. It uh, 
the, the underlying discussions already there, the contradictions that are present in our society. And uh, or with this COVID crisis, uh, even sharper and more uh, clearer. And one of the most important things that struck me was that uh, health can in fact not be a product, a market product in a market economy. Health is a right. And it's clearly something that even when you have a market economy, you have to put it out of the economic uh, laws of, on, of the market economy. Because if you want to consider it as a right, you have to fulfill this right for all your citizens. And it's uh, also something you can uh, enlarge for some other rights, uh, just like the right on for knowledge or education. Uh, and that's the completely opposite point of view of a neoliberal economy that just wants to um, put all these fields of human behavior inside the market logic. So I think COVID is making very clear that some fields of our uh, human uh, and social behavior are outside of the market laws and have to be kept outside of the market laws. Okay. So according to what you're saying is that Corona makes everything sharper and clearer. And you, I also noted that um, health is a right. It should not be a part of the market uh, or it should not be marketed. And that's something you indeed uh, question or we can also discuss later on uh, and elaborate on it. The last person I would like to answer this question is uh, Jan Mertens from the yeah, thank Federal you. Department. Yeah. Um, I think this, this current crisis can teach us something about what I would call rationalities and different types of rationalities. Uh, I think what, what we thought or some of us thought that was rational is not necessarily very rational or is not the kind of rationality we need. When, when we look at um, the way we have organized economic globalization, which was a process that was organized deliberately on basis of deliberate political choices based on a specific theory of how the world and economic, economics works, this kind of globalization with its lengthened or stretched supply and value change chains combined with very specialized, uh, highly efficient components and a just in time delivery has proven to be very vulnerable. It was meant to be rational and efficient, but it turned out to be very, very vulnerable. And I think, um, we can use this experience of this, this reading of the current crisis to look at, uh, at economics. This was a question. Uh, maybe it can help us to look at rationalities that are actually dangerous in the real world, but seem to be logic or rational in the textbooks of economics. For instance, the idea that economic growth is possible in a limited world is officially rational, but it doesn't work in the real world. The idea that, that, that we as individuals are uh, simply rational homo economicus driven by, by endless needs uh, is the kind of rationality we don't need. The idea that, that overshoot is just seen as simply a market failure is a kind of rationality. And I think we need another kind of rationality and, and looking at this crisis can help us to interpret our economic textbooks. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jan. So I wrote down that um, COVID actually stressed or showed the vulnerability we have of our global system. And that um, the idea we have of the ra ra rational homo economicus um, may not always work. Um, so if I summarize what I heard from the five panelists, it actually made things clear, sharpened things, made us question things, what we are doing. Uh, although apparently there is also an undertone of it does offer us ways of measuring it, of working together globally. So there are some positive things we can use from economics as an academic discipline, but it also make us question our current approach maybe our current way of thinking, maybe the current way what we are teaching to students. And this brings us actually to the second question, 
Um, so thanks for that first opening statement. I have seen that in this at the moment there are question questions coming in the chat box, but some of these questions will be discussed when the panelists will answer the upcoming questions. And if not, then we will come back to it for sure. So if we focus on on the impact of the economy um, on our society, and also now the fact that COVID makes certain things sharper what kind of economists does the world need so some of you are economists some aren't but what do you believe should be the, the purpose of having economists on this planet or maybe we don't need them at all huh? that can also be one of the statements that can be given by you so who of the panelists would like to start answering this question what kind of economists does the world need Um, Later. Yeah. I think what is very important is that we have, uh, well, first of all, I think we have to agree that uh, economy and uh, studying economy is a social science. So there are no truths there. So that means that being neutral is impossible in a world where we, because I, I think that's often a problem with uh, economists that they want to be neutral and having their models, but every model has a political value there. Um, so I think we need engaged economists, uh, people that are uh, really wanting to make this world a better place. Um, and then what we need, of course, is to have a sustainable way of producing first and consuming. So that's, and that has to be within the limits of our uh, planetary boundaries. So I agree with Jan that economic growth on a finite planet is just impossible. So we need economists that also recognize this. So that, that they are also connected with, uh, let's say, the planetary boundaries, which is partly um, biology, is uh, whatever. So I think we need also people that are multidisciplinary in, in, their, in their looking and seeing economics only as a tool, as an instrument to, to make this world a better place. So economics is not the, the goal as such. And they can't see this as having a healthy economy and that has to be on the cost on whatever. I think we need a healthy world and the economy is just a way of how we organize our consumption, production and trading and etc. I mean, part of it, because you can do a lot on local levels as well, which was said as well. Uh, but I think that would be my first um, uh, reaction. So we need engaged economists and it's a social science. So it's not no. neutral. Okay. I can only agree with this point of view. I think um, every scientist, as every human being, has a worldview, has a way of viewing the world, of framing the world. And we as scientists have only um, uh, maybe a toolbox of theories and, and, and that helps us to have a sharper view of the world. But if we are not aware of the fact that basically we have a worldview as well and that even using our toolbox, we are also including our, uh, not only our emotions, but also our values in the work we are doing. What, and that's very important, I think, for economists to rethink the goal of economy. And the basic thing, what you see nowadays is that at least politicians, they reduce economy to a question of growth because uh, it has already been pointed out that growth in an a growth without limits, it's not possible on a limited planet, but if you look at the discussions on economy, it's always about growth, it's only about growth. And in this uh, sense, maybe the virus, the epidemic, the pandemic is interesting to see that even a very small growth, even if you have 1.1 reproduction factor, then you have an exponential growth at long term. So an economy growing with by 1%, if it's growing every year after 70 years, it's a double uh, producing what we are doing today. So speaking about 2% or 3% of growth, it's enormous and it's uh, something that's impossible in the long run for us to manage the planet with a two or 3% growth. So I think this, this goal of economy has to be made much more sharper that the goal is to serve uh, the society and not uh, to be a something that's yeah in fact taking taking the the society as hostage because of the growth that has to be there 
Okay, thank you, Patrick. So we need engaged economists and we should also have economists that perhaps rethink the goal of economy. Who wants to comment on that from the panelists or at? Uh... I can, uh, yep. I can continue. Yep. So um, I have to say that uh, basically I agree with what has been said, but uh, being a trained economist, uh, I, I don't see anything um, this di which diverges from what you have said. So I've been classically trained and I can see all these points and the importance of these views. And I definitely agree that uh, economics offers a toolbox. And this is what I said uh, in answering the first question. Um, when it comes to what kind of economies does the world need, which is a really a huge question and uh, I feel rather small uh, when trying to answer it. Uh, I did a short poll on my social media accounts and received the following answers from economists and non-economists. So we need diverse ones, definitely not one kind. We need independent economists. We need ones with a heart. We need post-capitalism economists. So again, I agree, we need diverse economists and we need all sorts of economists, both uh, who look at problems from a micro or macro perspective uh, look at uh, problems from a theoretical or empirical perspective, so use data or theoretical models, or more specifically, uh, we need labor, development, environmental, health, happiness, education, behavioral, gender, crime, monetary, financial, and all sorts of economies. So believe it or not, there are also economists who look at the economics of wine, economics of beer, economics of chocolate, so we need them as well. Uh, but what I would like to stress is that um, uh, we really need more female economists and we need more minority economists. So what uh, the, 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 the economics as a discipline has a quite a poor reputation in this sense because the profession is quite uniform and is dominated by white men. So I think this, has, needs, uh, this needs to change and there are several... Um, initiatives both uh, in the US and in Europe and other parts of the world in order to stimulate this kind of profile of, a, of an economist who does not have to be a white man. Um, and if you want me to answer the question, why do we need female economists? Well, I mean, because women are just as good in mathematics and economics as men, uh, because they tend to put uh, prioritize different topics on their agenda and maybe focus on problems which uh, uh, women face because they might be more pro-socially oriented, more policy oriented because of their leadership styles. And because if we have more female economists, uh, they also uh, present themselves as role models and they offer trickle down effects for other young women to join the profession. Okay, that's a very nice addition. So I wrote down that we need diverse, independent, uh, post-capitalist economists with a heart. And we also need more female and more minority economists. Correct? Yes. We still have two panelists, which we didn't hear answering this question. So Emmanuel or uh, Jan. Okay, I will start. Um, I, I would like to continue with where I ended my first intervention. I think the kind of economist we need is someone who is not afraid of falling into a black hole when questioning the so-called rationality of classical economic thinking, because I think in itself it's kind of a black hole sometimes. Uh, what what, what um, strikes me a lot, um, I'm not an economist by training, I studied language and literature, but this, this made me maybe sensible, sensitive for the, the strength and the importance of images and metaphors that are used in, in this so-called exact science, which is the social science. And I think we need economists who have the, the courage and the imagination of uh, working on new images, new narratives, new metaphors. One of the reasons I like, the, everyone knows the book of, of, by Kate Rayworth of Donut Economics. Why I like it so much is that's exactly what she's trying to do, trying to look for new images, new metaphors, new ways of looking at the world. Um, this is something we need. Another example that can be useful is um, 
maybe you also read it, there was a paper published last year uh, for the OECD, a paper on growth, beyond growth, uh, uh, into a new paradigm. And it's, it's almost a didactic description of everything that is wrong with the classical way of economic thinking. And this can also help to, to, to work on a new narrative because the kind of economist we need, in my view, is an economist for the real world. And the real world is a limited planet uh, confronted with climate change, with uh, inequalities. This is the real world. And, and we need economists for this real world. Thank you. Hey, that's also very clear. We need economists for the real world. We need people with, or economists with courage and imagination to come up with new narratives. Emmanuel, last but not least, what kind of economists do we need, according to you? Um, I do like uh, a sentence of Albert Einstein explaining that we cannot solve the existing issues with the same way of thinking. And this is the reason why I think we do need people, we do need economists having a systemic approach because we need to connect the dots. We need to connect the relationship between contributions of some regenerative economy and some initiative uh, creating more value uh, for the nature, for the human beings, and to connect the dots with externalities coming from capitalist companies uh, destroying the value and destroying the human capital and also the nature of capital. Um, I think we do need also to have economists involved in the real economy. Um, so involved in the real economic activities at the local level, because this is one of the best way to experiment uh, what's the economy in the true life. Uh, it could be as advisor, of course, a member of advisory board, for example, um, but I think it's quite important. And the last point, it's also to create a bridge, because um, for me, we need to create bridge between the classical approach and the, the new, the regenerative, collaborative, peer-to-peer uh, -peer approach, and not to, to create a wall between, between them, because um, we cannot change the current economy if we, uh, we create just opposition between the people. We need to connect them. We need to create links between them so can, they can see that we can change the current situation. Thank you for sharing that. So I know that we need a systemic approach or economists looking at it from a systemic point of view. We need them also to focus on the real uh, economy on, on a local level. And we should also be able to bridge between the classical view and the more regenerative, regenerative approach and the peer-to-peer -peer approach of today. Wow, okay. Um, if we need that kind of economists, of course, they need to be trained. Uh, for that, uh, we focus now on what's happening in universities and business schools, which brings me to the next question. And in the meantime, I see there's a whole discussion going on in the chat box. Very good. Um, we'll summarize it at the end and then start asking the question to the panelists. Mm -hmm. So if we need uh, this kind of economists, as we just described, or the panelists just described, how do you see the role of universities and business schools in the upbringing of such economists uh, with a heart, which are independent, which are perhaps more female, uh, more uh, from minorities. Um, so what should be their role? And I know that there are some um, school uh, deans or university deans listening into this conversation. So um, I hope they listen carefully and hopefully we can learn something from the panelists. Who would like to start answering this question first? Or oh, maybe it's already there. Huh? But I don't know. Will I give a start? I Jan, you will open. Okay. okay. Um, I, I'll try to answer in, in a very simple way. I I remember having some talks with um, years ago with with Tim Jackson, the author of the book Prosperity Without Growth. And what struck me very much is that he explained that when his book was published, published and he started giving readings, he was really overwhelmed by students at universities with the question, where can we learn this kind of economics? And, and uh, mm -hmm. 
it should be noble that it is the other way around. I think um, changing what is seen as normal, it should be normal that when you are a student, you can go to university and say, well, I will take a course here at the university in ecological economics. It should be normal. It should be normal that you can make a PhD on it at a university. It should be normal that you can find funding when you try to do some research, research on um, a post-growth economic system as the basis for our social security. It should be normal that you can find funding for this, which is not the case now. It should be normal that you can find funding for interdisciplinary research, which is also difficult these days. It should be normal to be working in teams with uh, scientists from other disciplines. Uh, all these kinds of things should be normal. And if this is the case, then we, we are preparing uh, economists for the real world, I think. Okay, let's, uh, how can we work on getting this all normal? Or maybe it is the case. I mean, uh, Sanchita, I know you've, you moved from the UK to Belgium. Is there a difference in how universities and business schools are handling economics within their department? Could you perhaps elaborate on that one? Well, I can say, uh, I can just uh, respond to funding interdisciplinary research. I think it's very much on the agenda in both UK and, and Belgium. And uh, both, uh, let's say, the, um, the UK Research Council for Economics, as well as the Flemish Scientific Organization have funds which explicitly promote interdisciplinary research. So research which is um, interdisciplinary within social sciences, for example. Um, in the UK, I was even part of something called the Southwest Crucible, uh, which was uh, where we were literally locked uh, with different disciplines um, in, um, in a hotel for two days and we had to come up with uh, creative multidisciplinary ideas. Um, and that was a very stimulating uh, environment to kind of talk to other scientists from other disciplines and other um, sciences and to try to create um, new research ideas. So I don't think that there isn't funding for interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary research. I think there is. What is uh, difficult is that once you want to pursue an academic career in such a, let's say, uh, non-traditional uh, fields, it becomes a little bit more difficult to publish because yes, I mean, to, to have a career in academia, you need to publish well. But when it comes to funding, I would think that this is now even the norm to be more uh, interdisciplinary, to collaborate, to apply different research methods, not just quantitative, but also qualitative, theoretical, uh, etc. So in, in that respect, I don't think that either that UK and Belgium differ a lot. It's just that in the UK, you have much more universities and you have way more uh, resources. It's a bigger country. So you just have econ economies of scale. It's more international, especially in academia. Uh, and that obviously brings more ideas, more interactions, uh, etc. So Belgium is after all a small country and we are now talking Flanders, which is uh -huh. even smaller. So um, yes, but uh, to, to, to answer, I don't know if I have time or- <laughs> Yes, please, um, you still have a few minutes. Um, <laughs> To answer my question, how what is the role uh, of universities and business schools in promoting female economists? Uh, well, I mean, you, we all know that in STEM subjects you have very few women, but you actually have very few women in studying economics. And uh, the higher up the rank you go, the fewer the women. And you know, it's another topic why that is the case. But uh, what could university do about it? Well, it should be more inclusive, both with respect to recruitment and promotion uh, of, um, of female scientists in general and female economists in particular. And um, I would just like to give a few examples of, let's say, um, Erasmus University Rotterdam, who has some sort of positive discrimination towards uh, female academics, uh, particularly if they had some career breaks or the University of Eindhoven, which in 2019 decided that they will only hire women for the following 18 months. So these kind of rather radical um, um, policies would actually really promote employment of women in all sciences, but also, also uh, economics. 
Um, what else universities can do? Well, they can actively promote economics as a discipline because what I hear here, you all criticize uh, what we study and teach to, to our students. And I, I, don't, I don't see why, because I, I very much agree with what you say, what the economists can do. And this is what I do teach to my students. So, so basically universities could promote what economics is about through open days, visiting high school, high schools, allowing high school pupils to attend open lessons. So University of Antwerp does this, for example, uh, popularizing economics research in a language which is really accessible to wider audiences uh, through media and social media, as well as participating in events like this one, um, because uh, studying economics and, and having this economic economist toolbox is really not such a such a bad skill to have and you can if you have this toolbox really study just about anything as i mentioned even economics of chocolate if if that's where your heart uh, lies um and uh, and uh, another issue which is quite uh, which is quite uh, present at the universities is that there is uh, that there is uh, there is some present discrimination uh, towards uh, towards female uh, female professors or female colleagues also outside of academia and there's something we can do about it okay thank you so you spoke about uh, the fact that universities and business schools should promote economics more um, in a clear uh, understandable language you also say that on the hiring part things could change. So you could involve the minorities and also women more uh, because that will give a broader view perhaps on, on, on the application of economics. Okay, I will come back to that later. I've seen a few questions uh, coming by as well. Um, the, the Leida wants to uh, comment on that one. Yeah, I would like to add on what was uh, said before. I think, um, what is uh, happening at the universities is that when you start uh, studying economics, you only start, I mean, you mostly start with a neoclassical economics. And once you have that kind of basic knowledge, then you can choose for environmental uh, economics or um, more public economics or whatever. But I think the, the basic is really still the very traditional neoclassical, neoliberal uh, economics. And I think that is that is totally wrong. Where I really think that, that from the very first day, you have to have, you have to teach economics where the whole environment environmental issues, social issues, everything. I mean, the real world is integrated in, in what you're teaching. And on the funding, indeed, it is true that, that more and more they ask for multidisciplinary um, um, groups to have the funding for doing what, what, whatever kind of research. But I know mostly the, the EU funding, uh, the Horizon 2020 and, be and before the framework programs. And what you see more and more happening is that uh, even if you have to do it in a multidisciplinary way, it's often that the goal of the research still is to be innovative in your production. I mean, it's mostly really the, let's say, kind of support for the uh, EU policies, which are still very market oriented, very growth oriented, etc. Uh, so I think it is indeed possible to, to do ecological economics and even post growth studies and PhDs, but then you have to go to Barcelona, where, um, where Mr. Juan Martinez Allier is sitting as a professor and there you can do it. But it's not something that is getting, which is normal in university of Antwerp or Rotterdam or wherever. I mean, if you really, really want, you maybe can do it, but you're not really pushed for doing that. I mean, it's not kind of, you don't find the professor that is going to, to guide you because they have no clue on what post-growth is. And I'm very happy that, that the whole um, post-growth, the growth or beyond GDP, whatever you want to call it, is getting there because we have books from Kate Roberts and, and Tim Jackson, etc. But I think what is also important is that the press and the media is also giving more space for economists, for economists that are really more into this post grow thinking because if because that's very attractive i think for a lot of students and when you have this more in in in, in the journals in the in the newspapers on tv etc i think people and young people will really start to to, to to study that that's why tim jackson was so overwhelmed with all the students that wanted to to, to learn more about uh economics without uh, or, or uh, yeah economics without uh, without growth so i think there is space 
but uh, we still need a lot of restructuring the whole CV for the um, for the uh, economic uh, for the discipline of, of economics together with all the other things. But what I also see is that a lot of economists are always defending themselves. I know a lot of them. And when the book of Kate Roberts came out, I mean, they were all in a defensive mode and kind of, oh no, they don't understand what economics is, blah, 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 all these kind of things. But I'm, I'm an anthropologist by, um, by career. And uh, what I also, I mean, in within the whole discipline of anthropology is also, there was also a lot of change. I mean, 100 years ago, they were still measuring skulls of people to know if they were in intelligent or not. And of course, we also, I mean, we, they also totally changed it into a social science that is so broad, which is much more interesting than before. But I see in kind of re reluctance with the economist to change it. Thank you. Yes. Uh, we're going to move towards curriculum in the next question. So, uh, because I think also in the chat box, I see a lot of discussions. I mean, are there other economic economic theories that, that exclude profit in their model or it's all about profit maximization? What about the fact that students that enter the university are still cooperative and after economic studies, they become more competitive. So that's more content wise. We will come to that in the next question. Mm -hmm. So we're still talking about what can be the role of universities and business schools? What could they do more or change? Uh, so maybe there is still Emmanuel or. Um... OK, so I, I fully agree with Leda. Uh, I think university has to give more, more space and the right space and the right place to the regenerative economy uh, and not as it is today because it's, it's just a side dish for most uh, of the university and especially because capitalism is uh, very recent in the history of humanity economy is not just the capitalism and so it means uh, practically speaking uh, university have to adapt the current uh, content of the course like, for example, management uh, has to include also the human relationship, it means also include emotions, communications, and also the contribution to the common good, for example. Strategy could, so, could also be based on biomimicry. Uh, accountability has to include externalities and contribution. Marketing uh, can also show the real value of the value chain, uh, including fair trade, for example. Um, and also probably include in the current in the current program some items like circular economy, regenerative economy, blue economy, and so on. So I think it's a full reset of the current program of universities uh, offering economy. Thank you. Which, bring, which was already. Wait, I'm going to wait until Emmanuel switches off. Okay, so which is already talking about the curriculum, what we're going to change. So somebody still wants to add what is the role of universities and business schools in uh, the upbringing of economists, the economists we need that are independent, can look into new narratives. Is there still somebody from the panelists who would like to add something to it before we move to the content? What should then be taught within universities and business schools? Patrick. Maybe just uh, one point, uh, picking on the idea that uh, Sunchika was uh, putting forward that uh, you, have, you need to have economists with a heart. I think when you reflect on this, uh, something very important. Uh, at some years ago, most of our students were also always thinking about science as something without values. Well, above ideological discussions, above um, point of views, something that is value free. And in fact, when you think about economists with a heart, that is economy that's not value free. It's economy that's thinking about the, the important things for human beings. It's an economy that is um, reflecting on economic laws from a point of view of the society as a whole and a holistic thing. So um, I think it's very important to teach our students that it's normal to have values and that you can have to combine values with a very scientific attitude and a scientific toolbox and a methodology that's so scientific, uh, that use scientific uh, rules, but it's not value free. And 
that's, I think, an important issue in a curriculum to uh, learn students that they can have an opinion about things, but they have to be critical about their opinions. They have to be critical about the values they put forward. So they have to know that always when they are scientists, they are also always also human beings. Okay. Um, Catherine, I think we are moving towards the curriculum question more than the impact from the universities and the, the business schools. Um, in the meantime, and I would like to uh, have Sunchicha also answering that question because we had a debate or a discussion before we had this evening uh, panel. And she was also referring to when she moved to Belgium, if I'm allowed to say that, that you found that within the University of Antwerp, for example, it was a lot focused on, on, on business economics, where in the UK, it seems to be a bigger variety. If I read some of the questions which are posted also on the YouTube live, is there blindness of economics regarding some contemporary issues because of its basic and specific microeconomical assumptions? So marginalistic utilitarianism or profit maximization. So it seems that some of the panelists, uh, some of the people on the YouTube channel are debating about and what is said here as well, that the traditional microeconomics is still the basis and then afterwards, they, they, you can you can read the book of Kate, for example, but at the end, is that something you experienced or that you can, as an economist teaching at University of Antwerp, can uh, elaborate on? Uh, so first, uh, regarding uh, my move to, to, to Antwerp and um, the, the differences, it's a bit uh, what I said previously. It's, you know, the... You have less universities. I mean, in, in Flanders, you have five universities. That means five economics departments uh, within each department. Uh, and these departments are within faculty of business and economics. And then only department of economics is what, you know, what in my frame is what, uh, what economists do. So the rest would be marketing, business, uh, management, uh, finance, and so on. So, um, so it's just much smaller scale. Uh, how many economies do we have and how many economic subjects can we teach? It's just much, much uh, smaller. Um, when, it comes, when it comes to the curriculum, uh, I, I understand the criticism which you pose, but um, I will make a comparison with, uh, with uh, teaching, uh, with studying ballet. So usually, I mean, I checked these ballet school curricula. You start with the classical ballet and the core fitness training before you really move on to contemporary dance and other more free forms of movement. So in that way, I mean, curriculum in economics is not much different. You start with the classical curriculum. Uh, so you start with mathematics, statistics, econometrics, microeconomics, macroeconomics. You also, you, you learn the basics. And then you move on to more specialized courses. And, and it really depends on the university how many of these specialized courses can, uh, can be on offer. I mean, you just don't have resources as a university to offer unlimited amount of courses. I mean, I would love uh, as a student to have a huge offer uh, of courses to select from, but then you probably should study in the US or in the UK where you know you simply have bigger departments. Uh, our Department of Economics has eight members of staff. Uh, my Bath uh, Department of Economics had 30 members of staff. So it's just economies of scale. You have more people and more people can teach more courses. So, so as a, to, to go back to this analogy with the, with the ballet, so once you have these kind of basic tools, you can then move on and you know, follow your heart and study labor economics or environmental economics or health economics or happiness economics. So I used to teach in Bath economics of education, and this is very close to my heart, but here in Antwerp, I can't teach this course because, you know, there's just not enough resources. I have to teach other things. Okay, I teach labor economics and I can then teach some of the principles of economics of education within that. But there is, in the, in the curriculum, there's no space for economics of education. So indeed, what Lida says, if you want to do a PhD in this specific field, you need to go to the university which has this field on offer. It's, it's what it is. So, I mean, there are just not enough resources. I don't okay. know what else can we do about it. And when it comes to, uh, when it comes, uh, so, somebody was, was uh, mentioning, uh, also related to, to fewer resources, 
You also have to understand that my department, eight of us, four people will go to retirement in the next four years. So these people have been um, at the department for the past uh, 30 years or more. So they have studied economics 30 years ago or more. Um, and it's not surprised that they teach some kind of old school economics or, or something that they've been trained at. So if you think about it, you have like a very aging profile of professors teaching economics in, 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 in Flanders and in Belgium. And you also need maybe some younger colleagues uh, to come in and, and change, change the scheme, change, change the space. So again, we are going back. That it's just a small country with uh, less departments and less, uh, less people. Um, okay, I see that Leida wants to react, and then perhaps Patrick, demography, maybe we can link it to H and see if we have some positive news from there. Leida, you first, but you have to unmute. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to react on, on the comparison with, with, with the ballet. I mean, I, I don't know nothing about ballet, I mean, except for looking at it. But I mean, I just don't like the comparison because the traditional economics and, and neoclassical or the neoliberal economics that, that you see as basic is not the basic. I mean, you're totally forgetting the environment. I mean, you cannot teach economics and 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 uh, and one year not say something about the environment. Environment is part of the of the whole economic system. So that's why I think that the basics is wrong. And I think I really and, and I agree that once you want to be specialized in something, then I think it's 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 good that that you do that. And I, I understand that. But I think in the basics everything has to be in it's exactly how I said if you if you study physics um, or, 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 na or nature, science, or whatever, and then you say, okay, if you want to know something about gravity, you have to wait for two years. I mean, this is for me in kind of comparison. I mean, for me, the basics is just absolutely wrong in most of universities. But uh, if I may add something to this, I, I don't agree. I mean, it's not that you don't mention an environment. I mean, I mean, you really have to understand what economics is about and I can see here and it seems out there there's a lot of misconceptions about what economics is and it's definitely not just about money and self-interest and you know not caring about anyone and wanting to to deplete the world and also you're mixing the roles of economists and politicians and you also mix the roles of people trained in economics who go do certain professions and then maybe become corrupt or, or you know, have other preferences or have to respond to certain political preferences or certain governments. I mean, those that then go on and, and, and make decisions, but like teaching economics. So, so last two years in the UK, you have a huge uh, uh, attempt to, to promote economics and to talk what it really is about. And Professor Rihanna Bandiera, who is a professor of economics at the London School of Economics, gave a couple of lectures on what economists really do and asked the audiences in London and New York to describe in one word what they think economics is about. And most audiences responded, it's about money. So it just shows this misconception. And if you just look at the Nobel Prize winners in economics of the, over the last past uh, past five years and what they got the Nobel Prize in economics for. So last year, Banerjee, Duflo and Kramer got Nobel Prize for their experimental approach to alleviating global poverty. The Paul Romer and William Nordhaus in 2018 got Nobel Prize for integrating technological innovation and climate change into long run macroeconomic analysis. The year before Richard Thaler got Nobel Prize for his contributions to behavioral economics and incorporating really, uh, if you want values, psychological perspectives of individuals into economics. You have in, in 2015, Angus Deaton got a Nobel Prize for his analysis on consumption, poverty and welfare. So I don't know, I mean, do you see all these concepts that you're criticizing being put forward by, by, by the profession? At least if you look at the Nobel Prize winners, I don't agree. But those economists that you criticize are, you know, those that are running uh, the countries or maybe are mixing things with politics, have different incentives. I don't know, but I think we need to split what we, you know, what economics is about and what it is that we see uh, people leading uh, the, the world, if you want. 
Okay, so it's about the perception and also about what we believe they should do and what we think some of them do, and there seems to be a difference. I saw Jan Mertens um, uh, with his head uh, making movements. So thank you for, for this, this difference in point of view between Leia Dance and Chicha that creates real debate, uh, which is good. Um, that fuels it a bit. Jan, what, uh, and I also Patrick afterwards would like to hear. Well, I'm... I understand what you're saying, uh, Suchicham, but I, I don't think it's it's that easy. What what I learned from feminists is that nothing is ever neutral. It all has to do with power, and the distribution of resources is not neutral. What I learned from all these people from rethinking economics, they they make these beautiful graphs of uh, what is taught at universities, what type of economics students have. And you see a very, very big chunk of neoclassical economics and smaller chunks of feminist economics, ecological economics. This distribution is not neutral. I, I had the impression that you seem to, maybe I understood it not correctly, but you said, well, it's the case, the distribution of courses, it has to do with resources. But how the resources are distributed also has to do with power politics. What is considered as mainstream or neutral or basic? And that's what I learned from feminists. And I think um, it can be useful to, to look at it more in a pluralist way. That's what I was trying to say. Patrick, you want to react as well? Yeah, I think uh, Suchicha had a point that uh, economic thinking and economic teaching and Nobel Prize laureates, it's much larger than only the neoliberal classical economic approach. But at the same time, we have to see that in politics, uh, policymakers are often picking those ideas that are convenient for defending their political view. And what's happening is that also in the media, the mainstream economics that are uh, distributed is not Deaton. Andrew Deaton is maybe one article in a year that about uh, mortality in the United States, and that's it. And it's not a complete uh, view on, on what economic thinking is, is about. So I think in the training of economists, what's much more important maybe is also to add an embedded uh, history of economic thinking, embedded in the historical evolutions of our societies. And to show how, for instance, the coming up of Keynesian thinking, how it was adapted at that moment of the historical evolution of, of the capitalist economies and how it was uh, had a role in the history and why this Keynesian thinking became, well, not popular anymore in the 70s, 80s. And, and what's this conflict and neo keynesian thinking coming again after the crisis of 2008. But then you have this austerity economists uh, popping up and they are the ones who are then used by our policymakers. So I think it's very important to embed economic thinking more in the global uh, society and in the interests that are uh, at hand and the conflicts that exist in our societies and also in the historical evolution. Uh, and specifically when you think about the Nobel Prizes, in fact, the Nobel Prize for economic doesn't exist. Uh, they have been installed in the 70s by the Swedish uh, National Bank. Uh, and they have been installed, especially in a conflict with the Swedish government at that moment. That was a social democratic government adhering a more Keynesian view, point of view of economics. And so the, the Nobel Prize have been installed at that moment to enhance the scientific status of economy and more specifically of the neoliberal economic thinking. And it was the, the introduction of von Hayek, for instance, has been done at that moment. So I think that it's important to, to embed the whole economic thinking in the more global societal uh, approach. Yeah, Emmanuel. 
Okay, we'll like also to add some uh, information because when I'm speaking with the students and I'm asking to them in Louvain-la-Neuve, in Liège, in Namur or in Brussels, what do you think about the regenerative economy? Is it useful or not for you? Because probably you need you need no um, no other extra information uh, and no extra uh, content about the economy. And what they told me most of the time, it's they know a lot about multinational. They know a lot about the money, they, about currency, uh, of course, about the World Trade Organization and so on. But they have nothing, no information about social economy, circular economy, fair trade economy, co co cooperative economy, about the local contribution uh, economy, about uh, alternative model of accountability, uh, and so on. So, I think, yes, um, today uh, there is not enough place for all the economy we need to change the current world. Okay, thank you. Maybe a question that was not asked, but I've been following a bit uh, the discussions on the site. Uh, what's the link with money? What's the link with how universities are financed, how business schools are financed? Does that impact the way curriculums are made? Uh, is there is that the case or is it independent? Um, because you were discussing there is a difference between the UK has a lot of universities, has much more resources than, for example, Belgium. And what I hear now from, from Jan is that if you look at the, the majority of the teaching, I think it is very neoliberal. And at the end, we add some other topics. Um, is there a link between the money, um, the financing of the different programs, the way teachers, professors are evaluated, etc. It's an open question. I don't know who wants to answer on that question. Leida? Uh, well, or Leida and Suchicha, okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well I, know, I, I think it's quite short. And I think it is absolutely true that, um, that the funding of whatever research has influence on the results. Uh, I just don't believe in neutral research um, uh, unless you do very fundamental um, research on whatever language, uh, I don't know how many years ago. But let's say if you do something on economics or social uh, sciences, whatever, I think you always have, uh, you, as, as was already said, I mean, it's about values, it's about world vision, it's about uh, what you want. I think, yes, universities are getting more and more private funding so that indeed influences uh, the, 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 the research capacity but I don't think that it's only for the department of economics I, I see that in all the other departments as well so I, I would that's I really would that's, uh, see or um, classify it as a general problem for research in in general and not only for economics but also hey, for economics. Uh, yes uh, I would I would agree with this uh, statement so when it to answer the question where the money comes from, so the difference, let's say, between UK and uh, Belgium is that uh, in the UK, uh, there's a lot of funds coming from fees. So the, the, the tuition fees are just huge. I mean, they're not as big as in the US, but they are definitely much higher than in Belgium. Belgium has one of the lowest uh, tuition fees. Um, so definitely that's sort of the money and, uh, you know, the, the more students you have, the more money there is. Uh, and obviously, if there are no students for uh, some of the courses which you would like to have on the curriculum, then you know you can't teach in front of the empty, empty classroom. Another thing that I would like to comment, and I agree with Leida, this is a general problem, is how are we evaluated? We are evaluated on our teaching performance, on our research, and we are evaluated on, on our ability to bring money to attract external funds. And this is definitely, so I don't think that funding will um, affect the conclusions that I draw from my research, but it will definitely affect the research topics that each one of us can spend time on because time is another re limited resource. Um, so in a way, we need to be able to attract funding because otherwise, you know, you're limited in the amount of research questions you can, uh, you can uh, analyze. Uh, and, you know, this kind of ability to attract funding is also one criteria into, into your promotion um, in the career. So to become full professor, you know, one criteria is to actually bring external funding. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I have a few questions from the audience to Emmanuel. Should neoclassical economics be taught in parallel with heterodox economics? Uh, I think we, we have to, to change the, the current economic approach uh, within a um, uh, question. Because when, when you look to the classical approach, uh, let's just say, um, let's just uh, give an example with the current situation. So if you look, uh, about the solutions we can uh, we can see in the street against the current virus, most of the solutions is not based on the current economy uh, approach, on the current capitalist approach. So one of the best way and one of the best moment to uh, to ask the the current ca capitalist uh, uh, economist is just okay. What can we do in this kind of situation? What can we do to to change and to fight against the virus? So I think asking a lot of questions and because we, we didn't speak a lot about this, but also about the climate change. Because if you look to the climate change, the, the current and existing uh, capitalist approach is not the best answer to solve this current issue and the future issue we, we have to solve. And so I think uh, facing the current classical approach with the current challenges of your humanity is probably one of the best way to change uh, uh, the, the approach of the current economy. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question for Patrick. How can we value something as health in non-monetary terms? So how to measure human progress beyond growth? Patrick, unmute, please. Find my point to find okay. my point. <laughs> um, well, the, the, the first thing is, of course, do we need to calculate the value of a human life? That's already a very difficult and ethical question. Um, and I have seen that in the current crisis, some people, not necessarily economists, uh, all kinds of people try to um, calculate uh, and oppose the economy to the uh, the, the life of human beings. So of course uh, you have to discuss and decide that sometimes how you are uh, distributing your resources and it's, it's, it's not uh, completely free to, to make some decisions also on health, but to calculate it in an economic way and to see it as uh, something you can oppose to economy is according to me, not the, the, the good uh, approach of health. Uh, I think when you look at health as a right for everybody or for everyone, then you have to uh, make uh, your your uh, uh, health service accessible for everyone in your society. And that's a political decision, how you will distribute the the level of, of uh, health you have you reach in your society. And you can see that, in fact, the most equal a society is, it's very important to contribute to life expectancy. And the difference between the United States and many European countries is exactly that. The uh, medical knowledge and the, the, our hospitals are not better than the ones in the United States. If we have a life expectancy that's almost two years higher than the one in the United States, it's mainly due to the fact that in the United States, health is not accessible for everyone on the same, uh, in the same way. So, okay. uh, yeah. I have, um, there are some students uh, following the debate and some, one of them said, I studied an MBA and only at the very, very end, Kate Rayworth was mentioned. Uh, somebody else writes, I took some courses at the Rotterdam School of Management. There were a lot of economic students and international business students. Um, and they laughed at the idea of environmental and circular economy. They called me a ready uh, communist. Um, so apparently in some of the universities where our students that are following this debate are studying, it seems to be not so common to talk about other than the more neoliberal approach. I don't know what. Well, um, these students are mixing economics with management and business, all I can say. So you can't expect to have an economics curriculum if, if you follow a, an MBA program, because MBA program prepares you to, to be a a manager, a CEO in a company to lead a group of people and so on. Uh, 
also business economics is different from economics so business economics prepares you to do business um, but uh, on since you are both in the Netherlands uh, basically Amsterdam has uh, the whole city of Amsterdam has actually took uh, Kate as advisor and will implement uh, the circular economy at the level of the whole city so there you go move to Amsterdam you can actually live in the circular economy Okay. Um, Can I add something, Eddie? Yes, Jan, and there was now a question coming for you, but go ahead. <laughs> okay. I would like to say something about curriculum. I'm the only one that hasn't said anything about it, I think, but it, it, it connects with what was said. Um, I think, in my view, we should prepare economists for the real world, and this should be reflected in the curriculum. Um, the name of William Nordhaus was mentioned and he, was, he received kind of an important uh, prize. But if I'm not wrong, his economic research was that the global warming of 4% is economically optimal. If our curriculum leads to this kind of thinking, this is not thinking for the real world. I'm, I'm shocked by this. And I hope that, it, that, that the students we are now preparing for the real world also learn other things, things that are important these days. I, I, they are mentioned already. Thinking about system theory, we need it. Thinking about resilience, thinking about how to deal with ecosystems collapsing and what this would mean for our economy. This, should be, this can become the new normal. Thinking about what is prosperity within planetary boundaries and may be important for the curriculum as well for my profession i think we all should start with reading lots of novels and poetry <laughs> if we want to learn about what real life is it can be used it's a bit of a joke of course but um, i think it is important to to broaden our perspective because i hope it will not be normal in the future that that a famous economist says that four degrees climate warming is economically optimal. This is a horror scenario. It shouldn't be normal, this kind of rationality. Mm -hmm. Any reactions from the other panelists on that one? Yeah, I would like to, yeah, I would like to, I, I fully agree uh, with, 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 with Jan, but I would like to, to react on what uh, Sanchita said on, uh, okay, that the MBAs are, uh, let's say, educated or, um, I mean, they have to be the, the, the future um, CEOs of big businesses, etc. So they don't need to know anything about uh, Marxist politics or, or economics or environmental economics because they, they know that they will be the CEO or they are educated for that. No, but no, no. I, I, I didn't mean to say that. I meant uh, basically this is not offered in MBAs. Yeah, but that's uh, why I, I think it's exactly the problem that we have CEOs as, they, as we have them now. I know that there is a younger generation is stepping up and do do things different, but I think I, th I think it's more important for those MBAs and those future CEOs that they know about social economics, that they know about environmental economics, etc., because they are the ones that are managing in the future the bigger the bigger companies. And we have we see now exactly that those big companies are the main problem. I mean, one of the main problems for in what, what kind of world we are living. So I think especially for them, it's important to know much more about environmental economics and social economics. Uh, so that's why I'm pleading so much that from the very first year for all, uh, all the students that are studying economics uh, without knowing not yet which kind of expertise they're going to have, that they know everything. I mean, the same, I, I see it in the chat box as well. I mean, the same is done in a lot of other disciplines that you have from the very beginning already in discussion on what is economics, how to do it, uh, what is worth, what are the values, etc. So that, that, that we don't kind of start with a kind of basics, neutral economics, and then you go for your expertise. I think it is important that from the, from the very beginning, because I, it is I, not without values. I, I, I fully agree, but the problem with MBAs and business schools and that th they are reducing the amount of courses which cover these problems in economics. So they're reducing the, the economics curriculum. They are focusing more on, I don't know, down to earth, practical, whatever, whatever they, they label it, type yeah. of uh, practical, pragmatic things that economics is too theoretical, not really useful for practice. 
and let's really I, I fully together. agree. I yeah, fully agree really that this is a yeah. problem, but, yeah. but basically okay. traditional curriculum in economics is being reduced to a few, in this case, eight members of the Department of Economics and our uh, 15 students. <laughs> we yeah. actually have a Bachelor in Economic Policy uh, at the University of Antwerp enrolls every year 15 students or 20. Yeah. But it's a very small number who actually chooses this these track. And most students want to study business economics, want to um, want to after that go do MBAs. And I, I fully agree that's a problem. They need more, not less economics. Okay. May I perhaps yeah. summarize here a bit that at the moment uh, business economics or management is dominating and that a lot of youngsters also choose to go in that direction because they think about the money making machine which is behind it. And then if you go to the pure economics, actually that's much wider, but it gets less attention. And what you're pleading for, I think, is that also these basic economics for all with values on it should be brought to everybody from in the beginning and then afterwards they can specialize. Is, is it that what I hear a bit in the discussion to some extent? Yes, but you can always, you can always set the stage. You can always say, this is what's coming up. So, mm -hmm. you know, stay, stay on, don't give up after first year, don't give up after first, uh, you know, exam in mathematics or statistics. Uh, you know, you, you, can, you can basically sketch what's going to happen over the next three to four years to students, give better examples, so really communicate better. I think this is what we can definitely do, not, uh, not to be like distant and, you know, say, okay, these models are difficult to explain to you at the first year, but you will learn about them at the third year. I'm sure you can kind of announce what's going to happen across the, the following three to four years. But I also hear that in the beginning of our discussion, we said we need economists with a wide view, with an open heart, where perhaps concerns like the planet and climate are taking into the equation from the start and, and not at the end. Um, we still have mm -hmm. about 10 minutes left. Um, I've seen that Anne Snick is also in the audience and she was... Um, so maybe we can have a few people asking questions straight ahead to the panelists. Um, raise your hand if you want to ask a question. I see most of them. So who of the people not from the panelists, uh, from the ones following in the Zoom session would like to ask a question? So if you open your cam and you, you raise your hand, then I can see it. And then you can ask a straight question to one of the panelists. Anne, do you want to ask a question? Um, well, yeah, I want to ask many questions or have many Remarks. I think it was a very good debate, a very good discussion. I mean, it's a complex problem. And I think there is an agreement that the people who run our economy uh, are not well prepared for the impact they have in the real world to take responsibility for that in an ethical sense. And now my next question is, how can we pull together and push, you know, I don't know who, the, 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 the Flemish government or all the 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 the, the 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 you know the panel of directors to say from now on next year this is what all students should have and not just economists i mean even engineers they all think that you know you can recycle a battery 100 percent they don't know nothing about entropy about the real laws of the of the planet so if we could like have a basic theory like the basic facts of how the planet works and how money works and how uh, social values influence all that and start with it right away. I think we should, we all agree that there's a lot of problems and we all have beautiful ideas about what could be done better. And I think we should start connecting those ideas into something that we can concretely pro uh, propose. And I just, I'm working on something like that. It's called the STEAM Plus project. So I invite everybody to join forces. Okay, and let's see how the panelists react to that. So how can we make sure that in economic studies all over, uh, not only Flanders or Belgium, the world, the there is a, broader view given or values given from the start. Any suggestions from the panelists? Well, if I, if I may say something, um, since you tackled a very interesting question, at least uh, since I'm now, I've been in, in, in Belgium for the past uh, six years and I'm, I'm not Belgian, so I can have both inside and outside of you. Um, so these five universities in Flanders are actually competing against each other. So they are competing for funds, they are competing for prestige, 
And uh, I would like to cite a colleague of mine, Yves Marx, uh, who is probably much known to, to wider audiences, who actually said, well, why don't we become University of Flanders? You know, why, why don't we use this brand like University of California and then do uh, more things uh, together? So maybe design more general curriculum in, in economics, but also other disciplines. And I think this is a very good idea. I think the, the, this, uh, this uh, suggestion of this course, I think there is a recent course at the University of Ghent uh, where a, another famous uh, person, Stein Barth, is teaching, where, which actually tried to put on a curriculum uh, a certain topic of view, view uh, as it is uh, viewed from different uh, social sciences. Um, but again, you know, this is one course at the University of Ghent and it should attract students to go study in Ghent and not in study in Antwerp. So there you go. I think that course is great and we should all have it. But or I hear least... you joining forces. I mean, working together and not competing. There's a lot of yes. competition going on. Maybe should, we should cooperate. Emmanuel, I saw you. Uh... So I have the, the chance to meet some politicians, ministers and so on in Brussels, Wallonia. And um, I know that when I'm speaking to the politicians as ministers and so on, it's not working because they are not listening because for them, it looks like uh, something very strange to speak about regenerative economy, peer-to-peer -peer economy and so on. But when I'm speaking to the human beings, to the father, to the, to the, the friend, to the, to the people living in the city uh, about the current situation, about what we need to change, in our, our current way of living, the, their eyes are moving and uh, they, they are starting to listen about uh, some change. So if we want to change the current program, academic program of universities, I, I think we need to speak with the decision makers as human beings and not as uh, decision makers of politicians. Okay, so, uh, so it's... Uh... A call for universities working more closely together. It's a call for inviting politicians in the debate and seeing how they can influence it. Um, other suggestions, questions? Well, maybe. Leida? I think we maybe we can also start already in the in secondary schools. Um, I mean, it's it's preparing the people that that are going to the university and also preparing there for them for uh, making the choices later on in their in their careers i think there maybe there's also a lack of a lot of knowledge that uh, that's still uh, i mean preparing them for the real world or the real university i think it starts maybe uh, maybe over there and again i think what is also important is what the branding is of several um, um careers uh, when we when we listen to the news, um, then the most of the economists that they uh, that they interview are the neoclassical ones, uh, not so much the environmental economic or ecological economics. So I think that is also something that is maybe not something that we can do in the university, but it's also the branding of the of 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 the of the profession that should be uh, different also, and that can be done in press and and everywhere, so that you all can show that you have many things to choose within economics uh, that are much more interesting and then the neoclassical and the new liberal, uh, liberal economics. I read here, we need to get young people to realize that it's fascinating field economics that may help to remake and to rebuild the world. I agree. It's 9.30. One it's... element I think, Eddie, this organization, Rethinking Economics, is one of the answers. I'm very much impressed by, it's a global organization. I think uh, professors in economics departments that feel lonely with what they would like to see can get a lot of support of organizations like this with students who are craving for this kind of thinking. So I wish this organization all the luck because we need this type of, uh, of, of groups to get things moving. So um, this is one of the answers as well. Thank you. It's indeed one of the objectives. And that brings us to the closing uh, slide we're going to share with you. Um, Catherine is going to take care of that. Um, there is still a lot of stuff uh, not answered, a lot of questions not answered. Um, but we hope the discussion was inspiring. It uh, gave ideas uh, for young and old 
to start working on it. I do take a positive message out of it. I think the impact of true economics, I'll call it, um, if that's being spread to everybody, will really help to change this world. We're going to uh, put a recording of this session uh, online. Feel free to join a Rethinking Economics organization. Uh, we, you have the one here in Antwerp with the link, but you have them in different locations. So also for the international uh, guests for this panel discussion this evening, uh, check in your own country. We do believe that COVID-19 uh, did pause the world and actually created a lot of ideas. There was a European hackathon last weekend uh, where Euro the European Commission actually challenged and it was also economic part. So tomorrow they will be uh, talking about which projects will be funded. Uh, so let's see what that's going to be. So I think there is a lot of, lot of things moving and we need it because our climate is changing, our planet is warming up. And I do not agree that 4% is indeed economically the best thing that, that happens. I think that's not, uh, he's not really be worth to be called an economist. I would like to thank you all for being with us, uh, mainly the panelists, also all the people of Rethinking Economics who helped us for organizing this event. We hope you enjoyed it and we hope to see you back. Stay tuned. Uh, we'll do more of these kind of activities. So follow us on rethinkingonomics.org or the Facebook groups in Belgium.